Well, my name is Stacy Briscoe, and this is Alice McGrath. We live in Marshburg, Kentucky, so we try to be real bubbly and got in around 2 o'clock this morning. So, uh, But I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming to our session. We are not public speakers. We're not professionals. We are just like you. We work in the classroom. We coach. He is actually a physical therapist, and so why not pull in the best that knows you know, strength training? So that's what I use when I coach. Uh, when I'm in my classroom, I teach PE. I've taught PE for 18 years, but I've been involved in the school system for 24. I've been an archery coach for 14 years. I do coach elementary, but I have been a part of the middle school and high school program. I am, we have three elementaries. We have a middle school, and then we have a high school. So all of our elementaries feed into the middle school, and then that feeds into the high school, which allows us to be a fantastic feeder program. And as if you read, uh, my biography, you'll see that you know we pull in high school kids into the elementary because who are better teachers but your students? Uh, they work better, they're younger, they are going to relate with your students. How many of you are high school coaches? How many of you are middle school coaches? And how many of you are elementary coaches? And how many of you do it all? <laughs> I guess that's better well said. Uh, that's fantastic. And you know, your work is proof of how this program is and that's to be admired and you know we work with students from all spectrums and that's why we do what we do while we love what we do uh, to give you a little bit more uh, my elementary team has gotten the opportunity I haven't coached the last couple of years at elementary but our team has gotten to go to the world tournament a couple of years and that was I don't know if it's still there but it was in Orlando which was a fantastic thing the bad part about it is it was tons and tons of fundraising I know you guys, if you coached at any level, that is a lot of hard work, but it was well worth it to see those kids be able to get that opportunity. Our high school program has won one national team championship. They have won two state team championships, nine regional. We've had two individual um, world champions, and we've had nine individual national champions. So we've that high school program started back in 2006, and they have just gotten better and better. This year, our coaches retired. So we're in the process of looking for a new um, high school coach. As I said, you know, we do this because we love it. And we have to look at, if you're, how many of you are PE teachers? Anyone in here a PE teacher? How many of you are teachers in the school system? So you see that, and you see your kids when you go to practice. You know that we are in a society, especially with COVID hitting, we are in a society that we have obese students. We have students from, like I said, all spectrums, and we have to make sure that we are taking that into consideration. Uh, this is a good way, archery is a fantastic way to pull these students in, to pull students with disabilities in. You saw the video this morning about the student um, that had limited arm use. You know, we experienced that in elementary age. We talked to a local guy that had the same disability, got in touch with him, we learned how to make the mouthpieces, and we were able to allow those kids to be able to shoot. And the greatest thing about that is with my husband being a physical therapist, he was able to help with that. He was, you know, working with that student. I was working with that student at our school. And then as he got to middle school and high school, he was able to progress, get stronger, get better, and just become more proficient. And I think at the end, both of them were shooting well over the 280s. So he just being- had the cerebral palsy and the cerebral vascular accident job. Right, mm -hmm. and he was in a, and he was limited. One of the students was, he was in the, it was in our Cardinal Hill unit where rehabilitation center where he was with ATV accidents, but he never hit, had an aneurysm. So at a very, very three or four. And so he was a, unable to use uh, part of his arm. So you can see, and I know you guys have had those same stories and it's amazing what you guys can do. But with childhood obesity, um, you can see some of the facts I put up here. It's just got it off the internet. Uh, we are, Triple since 1975, we see that. And there are reasons for that. Uh, 2016, I'm not going to read this to you. You guys can read this. But you can see just over the years, it has tripled, doubled. Um, we are just trying to find time as a PE teacher, as a physical educator. I'm limited on my time. And what I can do, they allow me to have my students 50 minutes. There's been times in Kentucky they won't even let me you know, they want to take PE away. And you know as a parent of kids, 
you, sometimes you have time, sometimes you don't have time. We have a lot of avenues as a parent, the world's becoming more unsafe. You know, it's, you're, it's scared to let your kids go out and play. Kids aren't riding bikes. Kids aren't just being kids. And what do they have in their hands? They have a cell phone. I had second graders that come in with cell phones, which is crazy to me. When my, my kids went to middle school, that's when we allowed them to have cell phones, just because they were away from me at that point. I, I wanted to make sure when they were going to their sports, they could get in contact with me. Kids are easily going on computers. What did we do this past year? We put them on computers. They did Google Meets, they did Zoom meetings with their teachers, and all day long they're sitting on those computers. So we have a lot of these issues. We have a lot of issues with adults. You know, our adults are uneducated on these things. So we have to find avenues so these students can get out, get moving, um, being able to be involved in a team sport, and what better way than archery. It is the, one of the, I think, and I've been a part of many sports, archery is a great team sport. It is a great, it's not only a team sport, but it's an individual sport because they, you know, are shooting by themselves. And then their score is, you know, accumulated with all the others. But it's such a great avenue for these students. Um, so childhood obesity, and you guys know this stuff. I just put it on a slide. Um, family environment. You know that again. That's lack of education for parents. That would be cost of food. Sometimes a parent going out and buying a healthy treat is more expensive than a, a heavier, you know, a cheaper food. Junk food. Junk food's cheap. It's easy. It's convenient. Fast food. How easy when you're on the go is it to go through McDonald's? Uh, you, I did this study one time in class that you go to McDonald's, you buy a Big Mac, you buy fries, and then you buy a drink, and it has like almost 800 calories. Kids go and buy cheeseburgers, those have so much more calories. And we don't have time to cook family meals. We don't have time, we're busy, we're moving, and we have to find those times. We have to, and what can we tell our kids as coaches? What can we do as a coach to encourage this healthier behavior? We also had sedentary lifestyle. We just talked about it, minimal physical activity. What can we do as coaches to get kids up and moving? What can we do as teachers? What can we do as parents to get these students up and moving? Uh, then we go into poor diet, high calorie, poor quality dietary intake, and then just plain up genetics. We're, you know, the good Lord above made us all different, thank goodness, and, you know, we have to be able to adjust to those different situations. And then we get into, you know, again, physical education. Uh, limited with students. Uh, what was it, about 10 years ago, I was trying to do the presidential challenge. And I don't know if you guys remember, a lot of you were, you know, my age. You have to do push-ups, sit-ups. You have to do, you know, chin-ups. Uh, just all kinds of stuff. Kids can't do it. They just can't do it. We had 500 kids in, our, in my school as elementary. And this is elementary. They couldn't do it. I think I had two kids to pass the presidential challenge. And that's a sad reality that we're looking at. It's a very sad reality. And as they go to middle school, what happens? They go through puberty. They develop into kids that we don't know anymore. I always say, you know, our middle school gets a bad rap because your kids are crazy, teachers are crazy there in middle school. No, it's your kids are crazy. Because they go through puberty, they're going through so many different emotions, their friends are doing the same thing, and just life changes. I, you know, that happened to our daughter. She, we thought she lost her mind a couple times, but, but that's just part of it. And then we want to talk about how does NAS fit into this. We talked a little bit about this morning. Uh, they're great. It improves grades because they're involved. They're part of a program, of a successful program. They're part of you being such a great role model for these kids. Then we go into self-esteem, builds confidence. You have a student that can't play basketball or isn't as good as another student because it's not based on your athletic ability. Athletic ability does help, but it's not based on those things. And positive behavior. I had some students on the archery team. They were known as just bad kids. The teachers would talk to me, hey, so-and-so's doing this, so-and-so's doing this. You get them in a program. I just did a summer camp. I just left, I didn't go today. I had a student and a teacher came in and helped. She goes, oh my gosh, this is so great for this child. They were on cue, never missed a beat. Actually, one of the best ones that I had in four days. Very, just very well developed. And relationships. You know being on a team sport, being a part of a group, they're gonna develop relationships that last forever. You know, 
being teaching in class is also different than teaching as a coach. How many of you do, you, some of you raise your hand again that you all do that. You teach in front of class and you, that's totally different. You have kids, that, I have kids that come in my class that can teach fourth and fifth grade. I have every fourth grader shooting and that sometimes is very, very scary. And I'm sometimes doing it all by myself, meaning I've had autistic kids in there and I've had, you know, just all spectrums and it, at just points, it gets scary. And I'll forget to blow my whistle five times and I'm like, just stop! But it, it gets crazy. But you know that and you love it and you do it anyway, each and every day. And when I go to coaching, I love the coaching aspect of it. You have kids that want to be there. You have kids that have asked you to be in it. You have, and you don't turn kids away normally. So um, the last thing I wanted to leave you with before it goes down is by incorporating certain fitness schemes, students can improve their archery performance fitness indicators in the classroom and health outlook for the future. And I'm very blessed, like I said, to have my husband that is into the strength training. We have to make sure that we incorporate this because this is where it becomes real. This is where they become stronger and become more proficient in the archer that they are. You've got to start, what can we do to help them build a stronger foundation? And First of all, I'm going to point out the elephant in the room when passing out the papers. Yes, my wife beat me. She passed quite loud more than I did. So we're all competing about everything. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'm ridiculously brilliant about one thing in life. I married way out of my league. So that's right. So <clears throat> being at the opening uh, ceremony this morning and uh, hearing her speak, and kind of the theme of hearing today, I just thought of something I wanted to tell you guys that I planned on. So I'm going to get into a lot of stuff with physical therapy for a living. I spent three years as a strength and conditioning coach for the University of Kentucky basketball program. With that program, I had, uh, I had uh, other programs, UK rifle team, volleyball, golf, that, and, and yeah, I had a lot of teams. But anyway, I was in the clinic working about three, three or four years ago. Had a kid in there, a 12-year-old kid, and the parents were with him. He's a baseball player, elbow injury. And uh, parents look around and see all these other kids in the clinic five, six kids in there, teenager low. And the, the dad says, man, what is going on? Why are all these kids in this there? So I started telling him, I said, no, 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 wait a minute, come here. I had him sit down in front of the sun. And I said, hey, buddy, let me ask you. I said, show me the worst scar you got from a really bad bicycle or skateboard accident. Didn't happen. I said, okay. I said, tell me a story where you climbed a tree a little too high. Got up there, branch out weak got a, or a dead branch or something, breaks, next thing you know, you're tumbling down, you break your wrist, get the breath knocked out of you, something like that. Kid never climbed the tree. I said, all right, last one, buddy. I said, tell me about the time y'all playing kickball with the ball out back. Yeah, goes man on first, goes man on second, etc. Next thing you know, you get in a little argument, you end up wrestling in the grass, end up with a bloody nose, but you stand up, shake each other's hand, go spend the night at his house, something like that. Never had that. I turned around to his dad, who's about my age, and I know what y'all are thinking of, about 18 or 19. But I'm not. <laughs> um, I turned around to his dad, and I said, you got a story for any of those? He started laughing. He said, man, I got five for each of those. I said, okay. I said, do you understand the difference in the world that your children are growing up in versus what we did? I said, he sits there on the couch. I'm betting all day doing this, right? Yeah, that's my dad's my dad's all day. He sits there all day doing this. Then you come home. You say, come on, little Billy, let's go play baseball. Let's go, uh, let's go throw a ball as hard as you can. Let's violently sling your arm through the air. And I try to explain to him that we, and most people in here, when we were that age, we were so much more physically stronger from swimming and going and hiking, playing in the woods and climbing trees and wrestling. We were also mentally stronger. She had to raise your hand for a lot of stuff. So let me ask you, how many of you hit cuts and scratches from mom so she didn't pour that red stuff in it? <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm the first one. I'd, I'd be probably infected in the corner because I don't want that red stuff poured in there, mom. So you're dealing with the, the kids you're coming up with now are different animals. They're different human beings than, than we were. Just, to, just because I was hearing what she was saying, I was hearing what I was hearing this morning, um, just to give you an idea of what you're doing, the deconditioning level is, is just so much greater. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about practical things you guys can do all the time, things I've done for years. Like I said, um, 
Archery is most common when we do this in our hometown, our small town, where we work together a lot, coaching, I coach high school wrestling, do a lot of other stuff. But the uh, very comparable sport is the, the UK rifle team when I train them. And I'll tell you this, when I was a strength coach for all sports, I was vicious. And I still train a lot of D1 athletes. We had two world champions come out to the house uh, last year, two fighters. Uh, my son's a fighter, I used to be a fighter. We, we trained at wrestling I'm pretty hardcore. You want to know the group that I was always extra nice to? Very polite to? The rifle team. <laughs> I did not need a problem from from a thousand yards that I didn't see coming. So I was always extra nice to them. But one of the things we focused on more than anything with it, and I want you to think about this specifically with sport archery. Think about this with everything. Your life, period, is breathing. Your key word is diaphragmatic breathing. I have a friend that, that had a PT clinic in New York, and before she'd ever address any of your physical issues, she worked two weeks on breathing techniques alone. The diaphragmatic breathing, the key to that, not breathing with your chest. You want to breathe with your stomach, all right? I tease the boys, the teenage boys, when I teach them, I'm like, pretend like you're at the beach, all right? All right, pretty girl, stomach comes in, all right, nobody runs, stomach goes out, all right? So you're gonna breathe with your stomach. Now the reason is, people think that our lungs, that you wanna take these big deep breaths, that is not true. You want your diaphragm kind of like a quarter, the way it works, your diaphragm is gonna come up and down. So when you take that big, that deep breath in, that stomach's gonna get big, you blow it out, the diaphragm comes up. The reason it's so important, specifically for a sport like archery, when I mean, you think about it, I'm a bow hunter. That's what I do. We, our town is a massive bow hunting archery community. I'll be overrun in about a month with guys going, come on, Brad, help my shoulder, we got to do this and that. They're getting ready for bow season. But with archery, you can just think, when you're here, and the kid's already anxious. You all are all coaches. You got a kid that's nervous, it's tournament time, it's state, it's whatever. Their anxiety's up, the respiration is up, the heart rate's up, everything is up. So they're already gonna be, okay? When they get that, that bow, that arrow stuck out there, all right, and they're doing this. I, I'll never forget, this happened years ago, a guy that was an elderly man, he was a special forces guy, defected from a communist country, and it was so funny what he did this. He stopped me in the clinic, I was treating him one day, out of the blue. And he said this, and it works so well for today and what I'm talking about right now. He said, you know, and he had this thick accent. He said, you know, one quarter of an inch movement of your arrow or the end of your rifle can be up to a six inch difference in placement of shot at 25 yards. He just out blue. I was like, okay. <laughs> but that fits perfectly. So you get it, they're already breathing hard because they're nervous, anxiety and everything anyway. And they, they're up there. They're using their chest. If you can teach them to use that stump, and all the breathing occurs with the diaphragm. Now, there are a million ways to train this. Yoga, there's that. So, so go home, Google that. It's going to be a lot easier than me coming up with the patch. The key is I want you to think about breathing with your stump. All right? Look that one up. Now, I want to get into some actual exercise stuff here. In physical therapy, and you had that one picture that you said you told me you had a picture of that. I think it would be on patient or something. Oh, wait a minute. Guys, if y'all don't mind, can we just pause for a moment and let me reminisce about the days I actually had hair? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that has left me, and I just realized I had it in that, that picture. So in physical therapy, what's that? A little. I was still, I was in trouble then. So in physical therapy, we find all the weaknesses. We absolutely exploit them. It's one-on-one -on -one training. This picture, uh, you can see I've got my hand on his back. What you can't see is we've got electrodes hooked up to his spine, um, electrocuting the muscles, the shoulder blade muscles, to pull his scapula in. Uh, because we have so many bow hunters, we do things like this, been doing this for years. I let him kind of get, I said, what do you do? Do you swim out of the stand? If he hunts out of the stand, we stack stuff up, we get him up in the air, we get him here. That's his goal. We do all kinds of crazy stuff. He says, no, nah, man, I don't get some, I don't get a lot of So I had this set up for him. But what we're getting specific about here is the shoulder blades, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about with some of these exercises. So the biggest issue with physical therapy is you've got your patient one-on-one, -on -one and we get to do everything right there. A team is a totally different animal, all right? Again, I coach high school wrestling. I may have 20 wrestlers. I've got to have 15 stations. I've got to knock this out. I've got 
got to be efficient. The most important thing is practice time. Yeah, we got to be stronger. We got to be faster. We got to be mentally tougher than our opponents. So I got to make time for this as well. So how do you put it all together? And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about once I talk about these specific exercises. The exercise I'm going to focus on go around your shoulder blades. Thanks for just a second, please. So if she turns around backwards here, shoulder blades right here, all the muscles that connect to this right here is the very most important thing. If I get a finger patient, the first thing we do, we work on scapular retraction depression, pulling it back and down. If I get an elbow patient, a wrist patient, a hand patient, a shoulder patient, a neck patient, a back patient, very first thing we do, low back, it doesn't matter. Scapular retraction depression, pulling the shoulder blade down. One of the easiest ways to remember this is, how can I get my elbow into my back pocket? That's one of the easiest ways to remember it. But this muscle group is so vital for everything, specifically archery. This program that I gave you guys, it was funny you mentioned this morning when the guy said, you want to give my shingers? This is one of the things we have our archers do. This is one of the things I have all our baseball players do in town, all our softball players. We're having an issue every year. Right now, I've got four college pitchers in my clinic. We have them do all this stuff. But what we do is we get them doing this in practice. The girls softball team was the, the probably the biggest difference. We kept having at least six to seven girls every year in there for elbow, shoulder problems constantly. I got them on this program and they do this for about 10 minutes prior to practice each day. I don't have any more, kind of hurt the business. I don't have any more back in there because it's so important. Now, don't get me wrong. We're gonna talk a little bit about abdominals, which are extremely important, hips. People hear the word core and they think of their abdominals. Core is your rib cage to your knees, all the way around your body. It's everything. So this what I'm talking about today is not the tip of the iceberg. It's if you were standing on the bridge looking in the water and you can see the tip 100 feet below the water. There's so much that goes into this. But these exercises today are a fantastic, super specific, smart start for you guys as coaches to put into your programs. I've got eight exercises we're going to go over, okay? The hard part is, is and we've got to get shooting time. Uh, actually, me and this is a gentleman I was talking to about, he and I were just talking about this, how tough that is to get it into practice. But once you do, A, you're going to have athletes say, hey, you can take this, I'm going to do this. B, I mean, you can take these, make copies, whatever. Uh, B, you can say, okay, Monday, we're going to do these three. Tuesday, we'll do these three. Wednesday, we'll do these three. You pick different ones. Or you say, we're going to do one of each really hard. I'm going, to, I'm going to make each athlete, instead of holding it for five seconds, I brought you what I use at the clinic. So on the back, you'll see all the directions on there. Hold for, repeat 10 times, hold five seconds, rest two seconds. Okay, that's a perfect world. In an archery practice, you may not have that. So you may get a fun game. What you do is you get in a position, you get it correctly, you get them locked in, you say, all right, hold. And the hold, they start, I didn't say let down yet. This is part of being a strength coach. Well, when I was talking earlier this gym, I was saying the very second you guys decide to take on exercise, strength is you're a strength coach. All right, which we're going to talk about in the, after I do these exercises. But there's lots of ways you feel you figure out what works best for you and your program. There's everybody take their sheet there. I want to kind of go over now. We got y'all a rough time right after lunch. All right, and we're hitting the big profile. We're speaking. What's the big no-no in communication? You don't eat lunch and then speak, but try to keep me away from food. <laughs> All right? It's my personal faith, okay? But I want to go over these. And if you guys want to try them, I'm all for it. Let's do it. We'll get up against the walls. I'll let you guys, because I'll tell you, I'm not the best participator in the world if you want to. Let's do it. I'm all for it. I'm going to do that. But if you look on that page, the first one we're going to do is the letter I at the top. You have an I. I've done this for I've worked at our PT clinic for like 24 years, so I've done this so many times. Thank you, sweetheart, but I, I just don't need to look at that. But, <laughs> but if we get up against the wall, and like I said, you guys feel free to do this, I'm going to walk over. Who wants to hear a good Elvis impersonation? <laughs> <laughs> Notice I found myself on the way up that one. So what I want you to do, I want you to get your heels to the wall. I want you to get your bottom to the wall. Then I want you to get your shoulders to the wall and the back of your head to the wall. Now the hardest part about this is with the head. What I do not want is for you to lay your head back. I want you to pretend like you're trying to stick the back of your neck to the wall. Okay? Now once we're there, heels, bottom, shoulders, head. 
At that point, I'm going to have you raise both your arms straight up. I want you to take your fingers and your thumbs, and I want you to try to press into the wall and hold this whole position. Now I'm going to tell you the hardest part. While you're pressing, keep your arms straight, pressing into the wall. I want you to hold your abdominal muscles, those belly muscles, like you're going to let someone punch you in the stomach. Hold them really tight. Five, four, three, two, one, and down. Okay? And then we'll do it again. So that's an I. What I'll do, I'll just go through one of each of these. Next one I want you to do is a Y. Just like we're going to do a letter Y, everything is the same. Heels, bottom, your back, your head. You're going to bring your finger, index finger, and your thumb in the shape of a Y. Keep everything locked back. Now, everybody flex your abs like you're going to let your neighbor punch you in the stomach. And I want you to push into the wall. And a letter Y. Hold it as tight as you possibly can. And I want you to think about squeezing your shoulder blades down and together. Good. We'll hold about five seconds and then relax. The key to these are pushing your hands into the wall behind you. Okay? The idea is squeezing the shoulder blade back and down. The next one we will do is the letter T. It's a little tougher. Everybody kind of gets personal with the neighbor, so be careful. Move around, everything. But the letter T is the same way. Keep everything. Heels, bottom, everything against the wall. Head, I want you to get your thumb. And your finger, your thumb and your index finger, so your palms will be facing the ceiling. I want you to keep everything there, and I want you to push your hands as hard as you can into the wall. Now think about squeezing your shoulder blades together as you do that. Hold them tight as you possibly can. And then relax. That's our letter T. Now remember, by the time you do this 10 times, we won't be smiling this much. It's going to be quite, your shoulder blade's going to be really locked in. Now, the next one's the W. I want everybody to kind of pay attention how I do this one. You're actually going to move your arms to a right angle, your elbows, so you're going to be just like this, like a field goal. Everything's the same, head and all. I want you to then press your arms to the wall. While they're pressed into the wall, I want you to think about squeezing your elbows back and down like you're trying to stick them in your back pocket as tight as you possibly can and hold them there for me. Hold tight, pushing those hands. Make sure those hands touch the wall. That's the hardest part. Squeezing and relax. All right. I got one more against this wall that we're going to do in this fashion. What if I take about six inch step away from the wall? What you're going to do now, if you look at me, I'm going to turn my back to you so you can see this. I want you to take your hands and put them behind your back. Let your fingertips kind of touch, but do not let the backs of your hands touch your back at all. So while you're standing against the wall, you're then going to take your fingertips, touch the wall, then take your elbows, touch the wall. And I want you to try to squeeze your elbows together as tight as you can against that wall and hold it. Try to stay straight and tall. Now remember the hard part, flex those abdominal muscles and hold. Hold, 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 and relax. Okay. Now, by the time you get 10 of those, you're going to be pretty tired. Now, what's the fun part is, is when you, when you incorporate this with the kids, you start them on the wall. With all of these I'm doing, you start them on the wall. And i got three more to show you here. About midway through season, when I go, oh, coach, this is easy, blah, blah. Then you have them lay on their stomach, put their nose to the ground, and you do it all again. <laughs> It totally changes everything. Then they're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Okay? The next one we're going to do, it's going to be a little bit easier. What I want you to do is pull your feet about 12 inches away now. Let's get a good foot away from the wall at least. I want you to lean against the wall, elbows bent for me. Keeping those elbows bent. I want you to push your body up off the wall with your elbows, and I want you to try to squeeze your elbows back and together as tight as you can. Again, holding your abdominals really tight. Hold for that count. And then back down. And then again, push away from the wall. Squeeze those shoulder blades back and the elbows together tight as you can. And back down. And normally, we'll be doing 10 of these. Now, keep your feet where they are. This one, second to the last one, is going to be the toughest one to actually get your athletes to do. Because we are all natural cheaters. All right, it's just the way we are. I'm speaking at a church in about two weeks, and, and I'm, I'm talking about you know the four reasons bad things happen to good people. Well, I start off with no such thing as a good person. 
You never have to teach a child how to lie, cheat, steal. They do it naturally. They come out doing it. All right? So this one, kids are naturally going to try to get out of work if they can. But this one, when you're leaning against the wall, you're just going to lean now, relax. I want you to keep your body away from the wall. Just like we were doing this, you'll keep your body away from the wall. Now, pretend again like you're going to let someone hit you in the stomach. I want you to contract your stomach muscles so hard that you roll your low back up against the wall. I want you to try to hold those belly muscles tight as you can. Hold them, hold them, even hit yourself a little bit to make sure they're tight, but press your low back against the wall. Now relax and come all the way back out. And again, contract the abdominals and push them back. One of the best ways to practice your diaphragmatic breathing is doing this right here. So every time I'm away from the wall, I'll take my deep breath. I'll start to blow out. How much air can I get out? Flex the abdominal muscles, press my back against the wall. All right, last one. I call this the boxer. Because the muscle we're working here, and every one of these, we're working on pulling the, the shoulder blade back in every direction possible. This one exercise, we're going to work on pushing it out. All right, we're going to work what's called the boxer muscle. The boxer muscle takes your shoulder blade and it pushes it out at 120 degrees. So what people ask me is, well, what are you doing? Are you fighting somebody that's seven foot tall? Are you boxing way up here? No. If you're down low and you throw a punch, then when you stand upright, now you're about 120 degrees. But what you're going to do, you're going to put both hands on the wall, get your feet about three feet away from the wall, and watch what I do here. Once you're about three foot away from the wall, you're going to have your hands out, holding yourself up. I want you to push your body as far away as you can without taking your hands off the wall. Once you're there, you're going to stay there the entire time. I want you to take one hand, pull it back to your shoulder, hold it about five seconds. You'll set it down. You'll pull your other hand back for five seconds. Set it down and go back and forth. So take your feet about three foot or three, three and a half feet away from the wall, hands up about face level, and I want you to push out as far as you can round your shoulders out. Once they're there, you hold them there the entire time. Pull one hand all the way off to your chest and continue to push out as hard as you can. Hold for five seconds and then switch to the other hand. Maybe you start and say, okay, guys, we're going to do three of each of these. Or you say, no, today we're just going to do the I and the T. But we're going to do ten of them. Trust me, if you do these, you hold your abdominals tight, and you squeeze those shoulder blades in, and you do it all tight, and you work on that breathing, it's going to be a quick five-minute, like, whoo, all right. Now, the key is, I hear this in basketball more than anything, more than any other sport, what do we do about working out? I don't want to mess the shot up in basketball. I don't want to mess the shot up. I want you to think about something. A few years ago, probably about 15 years ago, uh, a term came about. It didn't strike popular like I thought it was going to, but I heard it a little bit in the medical community for a while. It's called eye posture. Has anyone heard of eye posture? Eye posture is something that you all know extremely well. This is eye posture. Anybody seen the kid do this? <laughs> Okay. Their friend can be right here beside them, and they're texting them. But either way, they're all bent over. This protraction of the shoulder blade, going like this, this is called an eye posture. This is what we're running into everywhere. When I come to the clinic, the easiest way, and I promise you, if everyone of you stood up, 99% of you would be like this. The easiest way to look at it is when you're standing there, just take a look, have somebody look at you from the front, if you can see the back of your hands. That means that you're already starting to roll forward like this. Guys especially know this when we were, you know, 18, 20, but we sat with our chest. We're walking around like this. Then we get older, and we get married, and we just don't care. So then we just kind of fall along over. And we just don't care. But keeping that back there is the key. Technically, that perfect posture is, you know, the heels, like I said over there, your bottom, your back, your head against the wall. The problem is, this is my joke with patients. How far do you think I'm going to make it walk around like this before I get that sort of tar beat out of it? All right? It's going to be pretty rough. But posture is everything. These kids' shoulder blades are everything. Their whole life, they are doing this on their phones. They are writing in class. They're sitting slumped back on the couch. Their whole life, everything goes back. We've got to get those shoulder blades back. All 
All right? You've got to get those abdominals tight to hold them upright. You've got to get the breathing techniques down. Okay. I did a little bit about actual exercise. And like I said, figure out what works for you. When we talk about doing this program before you shoot, that can be a great thing because their whole day is here. I want to get them locked back and down and tight before they ever start to draw a bow. Okay? I want that already there. If not, they're already here. Then they draw and they're like, oh, hurt my back. We got a muscle spasm. You go ahead and get those locked back, they're going to have an easier time getting that bow down. So I personally would do them in the beginning. I would also hold them accountable and say, hey, I'm your coach. You're my athlete. You will do this at home. Do all of them. All right? Okay, I want to talk a little bit about what I said earlier. The second you guys go to implement exercise, you have now become strength and conditioning coaches. Primary function of the strength and conditioning coach is keep and make your athlete healthy and healthier. All right? Don't let them get injured. So the more they exercise, the better. The other thing is motivation. At the high school level, it's a lot different than college. College, professional level, man, I can really crank on these kids. They've signed scholarship papers. I had an athlete at my house for two years now. I just went to Marshall, was playing on a full ride. You can just pound these kids. Okay, middle school, uh, elementary, it's tough. So one of the things I do when I coach, especially when I wrestle, I've got like 10, 15 quotes that I make them memorize. I will yell part of it, they've got to bring it back to me. This also makes it kind of fun. I'll show you it being kind of fun. But the first one I always tell them is, the will to win is not half as important as the will to prepare to win. And what I mean by that, everybody at the state championships and at the worlds, man, they want to win, they want that goal, they want to be the star on their team, they want everything. But how bad did you want it six months before? How bad did you want it six weeks before? How bad did you want it to say, hey, I'm going to do those exercises coach uh, brought to me that, I got, that, that he brought home from that seminar? You know, you got to kind of ingrain that in their head because these are athletes. And they do want to win, all right? But I push that. Another one I push a lot is that practice does not make perfect. And I know you all heard this. Perfect practice makes perfect. I told my kids this when I train them. I would rather see you do, ter to do three perfect push-ups than 30 junky push-ups. So when they go, if you can emphasize with your athletes, again, it's efficiency. You can take 50 shots. They want to laugh with their friends and pull it at the bottom. But they can also take five shots with perfect breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, perfectly steel, holding the shoulder blades back. Everything's perfect. So perfect practice makes perfect, just to help with that coaching round. The last one I do for pure fun, I love it. I tell these kids, if you're not cheating, you don't care enough. Now, people are like, whoa, whoa, coach, you want us to cheat? What are you talking about? I said, hey, you know the cheat? Because guess what you're going to do? Nobody else knows about diaphragmatic breathing. Nobody else knows how important it is to keep your shoulder blades locked back. We're going to sneak you home when nobody's around to work on that. So when other kids are, and you're out there just breathing with your stomach and nothing's moving, man, you got a cheat code. Strength and conditioning, all of these, these are your cheat codes for getting better. Okay? I am not the best athlete in the world. When I was a fighter, I learned to be a phenomenal in my ground technique so that bigger people I could win against. I would push myself to be in the best condition so I didn't get tired, okay? These are cheat codes in life, all right? So you can have fun with that with the kids. One last thing, one word that I push with all of them, because remember, if you implement this, you're a strength and conditioning coaches. The word discipline. Here's what I tell everybody. Motivation will fail you. Excitement will fail you. Enthusiasm, drive, heart, it all fails you. Only one thing will always pay off in the end, and that's discipline. And what I mean by that is, Coach, I don't feel like doing my 30 shots today. Don't care, do it anyway. Coach, I don't feel like working on my breathing techniques. Don't care, do it anyway. When you do repetition after repetition after repetition, when the moment is down, had a wrestler this year in the state tournament. Got caught in the move. He should have never got caught in. All because I told him, I said, you started thinking. You can't think. you got to let the thousands of repetitions you've done leading up to this day be what takes over at this moment and gets you through. And that's where discipline comes in. That's where you guys as coaches can say, hey, you know, we're going to be disciplined. You know, I want you to do, I want you to take this home. I want you to promise me you're going to do this once a day. Make five of them. Once a day, you promise you to shake my hand, have fun with it. You know, Nugent, I, I have a lot of fun with my athletes. 
but, but you gotta make them wanna run through that brick wall for you, okay? But if you can implement this, I will promise you, I'll shake your hand, if you can implement shoulder blades, scapula, work, strengthening, you will have better archers. If you can implement breathing techniques, you will have better